Welcome to a Conversation with the Geographer. I'm Mike DeVivo, Professor of Geography at Grand Rapids Community College, and today we have Rebecca Sheehan, Associate Professor of Geography at Oklahoma State University, who happens to be our visiting geographical scientist to deliver the Distinguished Gamma Theta Epsilon Lecture tonight at the Race, Ethnicity, and Identity Conference. And we're going to discuss Rebecca's views on geography and how she became involved in pursuing this discipline. Rebecca, um, you grew up in southern Indiana and you later went to Purdue and you didn't study geography, um, but, but you had some understanding of, of the essence of geography. Would you care to comment on how uh, there was some sort of inspiration early on in your life that you reflected upon that uh, made you pursue this field? Sure, and I've actually thought about this a lot. You know, how do we become a geographer? or How do we realize we're a geographer, mm -hmm. really? And uh, growing up in southern Indiana, in rural Indiana, we had moved from, my family had moved from Louisville, Kentucky, and <coughs> we were in the suburbs, and we moved to a very rural area, and I was about three, so it was really the only thing that I knew. Growing up, my sisters um, and I always played outside down by a creek right behind our house, but it was very rural. My sisters were my only playmates. So it wasn't, there wasn't a neighborhood, there wasn't anything like that. And what we would do, we didn't play house. What we did, we would organize these little living arrangements where everyone had their own club. And we would make little paths and we would have um, you know, like a little shop here or something here or something there. So I was always really organi organized in how I was thinking about what we were doing with this creek area. So we always, we would go, we would leave in the morning and we wouldn't come back until lunch and then we would go back in the afternoon. And um, so we never played house. It was just always more about constructing these environments for ourselves down by the creek. And I really believe that that was my early calling to understand how humans and the environment interact. Now later I went more of a, how, uh, of a route of how um, humans and culture interact with environment and more of urban geography, but really it's always about these cultural landscapes that we create that, I th that I'm interested in that I think goes back to when I was that little girl, six or seven. Have you thought of doing any work in children's geography well, as, as you f reflect on these things? Well, actually, I hadn't until just this <laughs> moment, but that would be a great idea. Um, I think that uh, when I went to Purdue and I studied landscape architecture, um, <coughs> you know, that so much is about how people are transforming their environment. And so then I realized, though, after I'd worked in landscape architecture and land planning for a while, that I was really more interested in understanding how people make meaning and how people have access to certain environments and don't have access to others um, and on and on. Uh, and so what I do now I think is just a different iteration of an interest that I've had since I was a little girl. But I think that working with, I don't have children of my own and maybe that's maybe part of <laughs> Part of why I haven't thought about that because you know it's a it's a totally mm -hmm. new frontier, but there are plenty of geographers um, um, that I read their work on um, children's geographies and you know actually quite um, recently I've done a lot of readings in the um, from the journal um, children's geographies, mm -hmm. and so um, that's a great idea. Well, it, it it's interesting because not to. Too many of our cloth will reflect, I think, as far back as childhood. Mm -hmm. Many of us might comment on undergraduate years or some inspirational figure that particularly captivated us. Right. You know, and 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 coming to that point, so you 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 studied landscape architecture, and then you went to Texas to Austin. Uh, you went to Austin. Uh, a, a very, very cosmopolitan city to mm -hmm. work in planning. Right. And, and there, as you worked in planning, um, did you find yourself more inclined to 
engage in geographical work? Did you identify this stuff as geography? That you Actually, I didn't identify it as geography, much like, well, and when I got into landscape architecture, I didn't even know that <coughs> landscape architecture existed as a discipline when I went to Purdue. Um, I guess maybe I had somewhat of a sheltered life. Of course, I had, you know, I had parents telling me, you know, to be a nurse, a doctor, an accountant, you know, all the typical engineer, all, the, all of those um, very stable uh, uh, um, careers. But uh, I think that what happened was I, I've always had very good mentors in my life. And um, when I was um, pursuing land planning and landscape architecture, what I realized is that I didn't always enjoy what I was a part of in terms of, for example, writing design guideline manuals for how high someone's fence could be, what color it could be, um, what kind of plants they could have in their, in their yard, these sorts of things, because we were doing planned communities. And um, so for me, um, I wanted to be on the other side of it. I knew that if I got into development as a developer, that I could have a lot more say in terms of what would happen on the landscape, but that wasn't exactly something that I wanted to pursue. And so as I started talking to my mentor from undergraduate, um, Jenny Russell, who's a landscape architect, she said, you know, it sounds like you're interested in cultural geography. I said, oh, what's that? <laughs> sounds very nice. And so she gave me some, um, some authors to check out, and um, she, um, you know, with mining, and um, Sauer and um, various other uh, uh, geographers. And, and, you know, I was in Austin, so the University of Texas is right there. So I went to a used bookstore, and of course, what did I find? But a bunch of books in cultural geography because the geography department's right there. And so I started, I picked up the interpretation of ordinary landscapes, mm -hmm. right? Meinig's work. Seminal piece, right? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And so that was my introduction into cultural geography. And so then I started reading more <coughs> and more. And um, I guess the rest is history, so to speak. And so you decided to pursue geography in San Marcos. Well, yeah. I, so I guess the rest isn't exactly <laughs> history. So then I was still um, not sh quite sure about going into academe, even though since I had been a sophomore in college, I had been interested in being a professor, but I didn't really know what that meant, and I didn't really um, have a lot of encouragement um, in my family to go that route, and it wasn't that they weren't supportive, it's just that they didn't know and they didn't understand, and so I initially went to Texas State to, um, to really focus on geographic information systems and um, to, in order to get a job, um, say, at um, um, the, I think it's the TNRCC, it, may, it might be renamed now, um, Tex Texas Resource, I'm not quite sure what that is. Anyhow, um, but then when I was there, I had other professors encourage me to pursue my passion, which was cultural geography. Mm -hmm. And so, and then they encouraged me um, um, to pursue a PhD. So, with a little bit of, you know, kind of push-pull, I decided to take the leap into academe, and um, I'm, I'm quite happy. When I was there, I worked with Craig Colton mm -hmm. and Susan Hardwick and Fred Shelley. And very nice people. Very nice yeah. people, wonderful mentors, and, uh, and they really opened yet another world for me. And uh, so then when I went to LSU, um, that's where I could really just bloom, so to speak, into cultural geography and dive in, you know, 100%. And by that time, Susan had gone to Eugene, and you and Craig were right. at LSU together. Right. And it he, was old stomping grounds for him, I oh, guess. Old stomping grounds. And it was really funny because I had gone and visited LSU, and, the, um, and I had no idea that there was a job opening and that he was interviewing. Mm -hmm. He didn't tell me that until after I returned. And um, then he asked, he said, well, what would you think if I went to LSU too? And I said, well, I think that would be fantastic. And um, so he was very kind in letting mm -hmm. me figure it out before he, you know, kind of let me know what was happening. Um, so the joke always is, is that he followed me to LSU. 
how, how did he strike you in terms of enhancing your, your, your talent in historical geography and cultural geography? Can you think of anything that, that, that he might have done, and any nuances that, that were particularly inspiring or things that, that he touched you with? Well, in terms of geography itself, I think that his kind of, um, his, in terms of how he pursued <coughs> his research in the archives, mm -hmm. he's like a hound dog in there. <laughs> 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 and he was always, he's always so animated about his work and how he's pursuing it and to just keep searching, keep searching. And he, for me, he made the archives come alive because oftentimes people think of the, the archives as just something that's dead. Um, but he really made the archives come alive for me. It was his enthusiasm, his intention to detail, his, um, his ability to share that. And, and, and it wasn't just the, his excitement about his own work. It was his excitement about getting you excited about what you're doing in your work. And um, so I think that that combination of him being such an excellent scholar and also uh, the way, again, that he um, brought his students into the fold and allowed us to, um, to really watch, right? To watch him in terms of how he created his work, and I remember sitting in seminars with him, and um, he would be so excited and so animated about talking about his work that it was, I mean, I, sometimes I think he forgot where he was. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's interesting because, uh, uh, unfortunately, that level of passion that diffuses to undergraduates and graduate students is, is, is too unusual in, in, in our field. And, and it's great that we have evangelists like like exactly. Craig Colton. He uh, was interviewed by a few of my students that attended the AAG meeting in Washington, D.C. for the production of a short film called uh, Geography in Eight Minutes or Less. Oh, great. So you should see that. I it's, should. It's, it's, it's interesting. So here you are. You're at LSU. And we're... we're were there other influential figures that, that, oh, that captivated you? Certainly. Um, I always said that my committee, I had the all-star committee. <coughs> that was, um, that's what I said I had. Craig Colton was on my committee. Didia Delizer was my advisor. And then I had two cultural anthropologists, Miles Richardson and Helen Regis. And they were, I mean, I can say again, they were all extremely in R extremely passionate about their work and really also cared about their students and made time for us, made time for me. I mean, Didia Delizer, um, she, she always had time for me in terms of wanting to talk about a concept, wanting to talk about a research idea, um, about methods, about uh, philosophies, about social theory. Um, and I think that was extremely important. Um, Miles Richardson, I remember sitting with him in his office, um, talking with him about a variety of, of ideas when I was in his ethnography seminar. And he, I wanted to try this new, new thing called autoethnography. Mm -hmm. And you know, and he let me do that. He, it wasn't a traditional ethnography, but um, they um, allowed me to explore, which mm -hmm. was really important. And uh, Helen Regis, uh, she has had, um, and, and actually as well as Craig, a long-term relationship um, with New Orleans, mm -hmm. living there, researching there. And uh, so we could share our field experience to, experiences together. And you know, she did. They all shared of themselves and their work. And really always wanted to hear about my work and what I was thinking and what I was doing. It sounds kind of almost, you know, Pollyanna, but when I say that it was an all-star committee, I mean, and now, you know, I, I appreciated it then, but now, as a professor, mm -hmm. seven years into it, I just think about the time that they gave me, and um, it, w it was 
so wonderful and so lovely. And, you know, I consider them all good friends. That's and we, great. I stay in contact with them. And, of course, I try, um, because I've had such great mentoring, even from when I was an undergrad, um, I try to do the same with my students. Mm -hmm. I'm demanding, and they were, but I also try to be fair and encouraging. You know, and I always tell my students that you know, pressure makes diamonds. And then, and then they kind of, you know, well, okay. <laughs> say, all right, but it doesn't mean we have to like it, I right. guess, right? Right. Now, now going, going back to uh, Texas just for a minute, sure. uh, your, your master's thesis was devoted to the Guadalupe neighborhood. Did that, mm -hmm. did that really strike you as, a, as, as a, a solid foundation to pursue the type of research you were doing in, in New Orleans? I think so, because a, a lot of what I'm interested in um, has to do with geographies of non-mainstream mm -hmm. or marginalized groups. And I also seem to be very interested in um, you know, the Guadalupe neighborhood, small neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Jackson Square, which is what I did my dissertation on, a small area, but extremely rich. And I'm really interested in how people are attached to place and how they make um, how their identity in part evolves from these places and the struggles that, that they have in terms of whether it's development or whether it's quality of life ordinances, um, these sorts of things. I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in that and um, I think also because I think it's important to try to help give voice as so many social scientists do, try to give voice to those who are sometimes overlooked in the mainstream, I think that it provided a good basis for that. And um, I went in and, and um, learned a lot about establishing relationships with the community, mm -hmm. um, um, underst helping them understand that they could trust me mm -hmm. and that I wanted to know what they thought, not what I thought they thought. And um, so I think those skills have, um, that I developed and continue to develop really do stem from my master's thesis. Was it in your Jackson Square research that, that you realized while conducting this, this very profound type of, of qualitative field work that there are people that were residents that had topophilia, but they were disenfranchised by the mainstream society. Oh, completely, completely. Um, I, that's when I really, um, because in the Guadalupe neighborhood, there were a lot of homeowners and the people mm -hmm. owned property, but Jackson Square is a public space, totally different deal. And so um, what I learned, uh, was that people were quite attached and in part they, even homeless people making home place, making a home out of Jackson Square. And of course, uh, lots of times people experiencing homelessness use public space to sleep and to do mm -hmm. lots of private activities because they have no other place to go. But it was more than that. It was more than a utilitarian. It was a community for them. Um, but also the same goes for um, for tarot card and palm readers, um, which I'm actually going to speak about later today, um, magicians, um, musicians, all kinds of mimes, all kinds of entertainers that actually it's not just a place for them to work, though it was also a workplace for them, but a place for them to in part create their identity and to really commune with other people, to have community. And so what I realized in Jackson Square through my research, ethnographic research, is that the, the mainstream white middle class isn't so fearful of those that are different and that they want to engage, even with homeless people. Mm -hmm. I've seen tourists, you know, introduce themselves to, to people who are chronically homeless which are the most disenfranchised, mm -hmm. I would argue, um, in public space. 
and ask them about their lives. I saw people, um, tourists um, playing drums, well, drums, you know, a five gallon bucket turned over with some sticks with someone who was homeless. And it's not to, not to, again, to romanticize people who are experiencing homelessness or to romanticize the relationship between those that are in the mainstream and those that are more on the fringe or on the margin. But what I also, what I also came to see is that there are more opportunities and there are more interactions than what often um, we are told through the media or what particular kinds of ordinances would suggest. And so uh, that, that kind of field work um, I thought was imperative. I did historical research on Jackson Square as well, but I really learned a lot about different kinds of groups and how they make meaning in a variety of ways through public space and why that is so important and why it's so important for people, um, not to get on a soapbox, but why it's so important for people to have access to public space in order to be. And some of these people are just hanging on the margin, right? Mm -hmm. But they're hanging <laughs> on as opposed to just going off into oblivion. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there are uh, lots of people who consider Jackson Square home. It's the, that they take care of their yard, that they um, look out for it. Um, and this is a, 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 a historical public space of obviously national significance and, and even mm -hmm. perhaps international um, significance considering, you know, the changes of power of the Louisiana purchase and, and the colony going through, you know, um, France, Spain, the U.S., I mean, it jiggled back and forth for a while there, right? And so it, it, it's such an important place, but it's on, on these really macro scales, but it's also still today so important on individual, on an individual level, and that's what I find fascinating about these kinds of public spaces. Well, it's it's an interesting place, and and and, and Greater New Orleans is as well. And here you were conducting research in an area uh, that is characterized by what some people might consider undesirable populations. Oh, right. As a, a young single white woman. Right. Uh, would, you, would you care to comment on, on, on your role in conducting field work? We don't see much field work conducted, by the way, in this fashion in geography as it was years right. ago. Right. So, so my positionality, being then a relatively young white um, woman, um, it, was, it was at times challenging. I mean, I, I did have to make some decisions. Um, in terms of how I handled it. I remember, um, um, you know, in the summer it's hot as heck there, right? And so I would wear shorts and often, you know, a sleeveless shirt and what tourists would wear. But, you know, I was there regularly, so very soon people knew that I was a regular in Jackson Square, so to speak. And, um, you know, sometimes I would have unwanted and, and uninvited um, comments from men um, and that were regulars in Jackson Square, whether they through all kinds of the population, right? Not just not just persons that were experiencing homelessness, not just the readers, not just the artists, but from a variety of folks. And so what I realized is that um, I needed to dress m much con more conservatively, that that would be helpful. Um, so I had to kind of navigate um, that. But what it also helped me because I was seeing even Jackson Square is highly contested in terms of the, the groups that are actually there, in terms of basically fighting over space. And so people are very suspicious of you if you're there regularly, but you don't have a particular role in tourism, right? Um, or you're not a known homeless person or something like that. And so as my positionality actually allowed me to be seen as relatively harmless. Mm -hmm. You know, right or wrong, um, I was seen as relatively harmless. And so sometimes people would ask me if I were, you know, an undercover cop or if I were with the city or what I, and I said, no, I'm, I'm just here to learn about Jackson Square. And I would often, you know, say I'm, I'm doing research because I want to understand 
why Jackson Square is important to you. And so that, sometimes people would say, oh, well, that's refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, someone actually cares what I think. Um, so that was helpful, but I also, um, I also, you know, New Orleans is a dangerous place, there's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And actually Jackson Square there, people really do look out for each other because people know each other. But it's really outside of Jackson Square where I lived about a half a mile, maybe three-fourths of a mile from Jackson Square and I would walk. Um, and so I chose not to do research at night at Jackson mm -hmm. Square because it wasn't because I was afraid of being in Jackson Square at night. It was the distance between my house and Jackson Square of walking perhaps alone that, um, that I thought would be unsafe, and in fact, it would be unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, so I chose not to do that, and so again, this points out quite easily the partial, the partial, the partial nature of knowledge that is constructed when you're doing research. Yet you were you were still able to develop a rapport with the individuals that you were you were discussing in your work. Oh yeah, I mean, I hung out with them. I hung out with. I mean, I actually even started to learn to read tarot cards. Right, I would sit with some <laughs> of the readers. Um, and I would sit with the artist. I would, you know, talk with homeless folks and stuff. And after a while, um, you know, they, they thought, you know, I had a place in Jackson Square too. I was the researcher. Someone even said that once. And so I spent a lot of time there just talking with people. Initially, I had thought that I would do semi-structured interviews, mm -hmm. but I had to quickly abandon that because of the spontaneity of Jackson Square and of needing just to be myself. And what I also learned uh, uh, in terms of my positionality and, and being, you know, somewhat different in, in, this, in this world was that I needed to be pretty transparent and I needed to be able to share about myself, too. I was asking people to tell me a lot about them. Mm -hmm. And they had questions for me, too, right? And so um, there's, uh, um, I learned a lot of give and take. I mean, we always, you know, often it's about protecting, you know, you don't mm -hmm. want questions to be too personal about you and you want to focus on the people that you're doing research with. But in these long-term studies, and perhaps even not in long-term studies, there has to be give and take. There just so as they revealed be. the bit about themselves, uh, you found yourself revealing a bit more about yourself, facilitating that trust that yes. uh, would be developed in this environment to essentially uncover the information that was exactly. important for you to determine in exactly. your study. Exactly. And I did that, you know, and I did that in a genuine way. I mean, mm -hmm. I was genuine about it. I mean, these are, you know, the, this thing about, you know, research in the field is being separate from, quote, real life is, is, I mean, there are, there are divisions, there are separations, and, you know, the field is framed in all of these um, qualities about the field. But at the same time, you have to remember that you're human and that you're a part of this world as well, mm -hmm. whether you're doing research or not. And that that's, I mean, people would forget that I was doing research. And at times, I needed to forget that too. Some people would argue against that, but that's, um, that's how I... But it seems like you were enjoying doing geography. Oh, enjoying? <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. It was great, and I learned so much being there. I mean, my, um, you know, kind of the, my dissertation, the publications that I have um, from that work only really tell a very small part of the story. I learned so much about myself and about people um, um, doing that work. I became, I always thought I was empathetic, but I became much more empathetic. I became much more empathetic, and... Um, um, you know, what a gift. Absolutely. Do you think you can develop that empathy without conducting the field work that, that really drew you into this whole study and maybe even the discipline of geography? I think that it's, it would be hard. It would be hard because it's just, it's, this, it's, re, it's about relationships, right? Sure, and absolutely. So, so th I mean, you you know, you care about a lot of people, but there are different levels of trust and different levels of, I think, probably empathy and understanding that we have of one another because of time. Sometimes it's just, it is just about time. 
And so um, that's one of the great um, aspects of doing graduate work and ha taking that time to spend over a year in the field. I actually lived in New Orleans mm -hmm. a little over two years and um, that was quite valuable to me. And so, you know, now, of course, being a professor, I don't have that luxury um, until sabbatical. Um, but I really do try to spend time, as much time as I can, with the groups of people um, that I'm working with and I'm, that mm -hmm. I'm trying to gain a better understanding with. Do you have any recommendations for for aspiring geographers, undergraduates and graduate students, especially concerning this, this, this matter of field work and how important it is? Well, I think that, well, again, coming back to time, people are concerned about time. They want to get their degree, whether it's an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, or a PhD, and they want to get on, they want to get on with it. Mm -hmm. But really, by spending time in the field, you are paying it forward in a variety of ways. And so that time is so well spent and you'll likely never have that time again to um, not just understand a place and a people, but to, de to really set a base for your research skills. And so I think that um, there's, there, there needs to be more emphasis on long-term field work and knowing that that's not always possible, but to try to put as much time in as you can in terms of um, whether it's ethnography or just a, a variety of methods mm -hmm. because that will allow you to gain a, a deeper understanding. And of course, yes, we know that, but I think that students often um, want to get in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And of course there are financial considerations, there are family considerations, all of these sorts of things, but I remember, um, I remember kind of being a little bit hesitant about, oh, wow, I have to spend that much time in the field? But my committee was adamant mm -hmm. about it. They, and rightly so, I and, guess. Right, and they said, you're spending four seasons there, and Didia Delizer, She's great. She, she said when I came back after my oral comps, and they, and you know, what, and she said, well, we all agree. You know, she had gotten everybody on board, but it wasn't hard to get that committee mm -hmm. on board because they were probably already on board. Um, two cultural anthropologists, Craig sure. Colton. I mean, come on. Um, so, you know, and I remember. So, and I said yes because I trusted them. That's sure. another thing is to trust your mentors to trust that they have your best interest at heart, that it's not about them, that they really want you to be set up as best as possible for the next step. Well, they sound like good mentors that, that realize that your, your degree was not an obstacle to overcome, but rather an experience to savor. Exactly, exactly. And um, even, you know, Miles Richardson, this, you know, grandfather, um, he's passed since um, a couple years ago he passed, but he, uh, I remember he, he took me aside after m that defense and he said, you know, you really want to get in there. You really want to know what's going on. And he just, you know, he had this kind of grandfather way of saying, you know, I have this for you. I got this, you know, I got your back on this. I know what's what. Mm -hmm. And I trusted him and I trusted my committee and always believing that they, they knew more of what was going on than I did. Clearly they did, right? I was in training. And of course, we're all in training still. Well, there's, there's a lot more that we can discuss <laughs> about this. And we look forward to, to, to seeing your lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your time and this conversation. Well, thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure.